Good morning, and thank you all again for attending the Michigan Sport Business Conference. My name is Jeremy Ross, and I'm the treasurer of the MSBC. The digital age is drastically changing how brands and personalities connect with those who support them. The sports world is cluttered with messages and symbols, and establishing personal and effective brands has grown ever more important. We at the Michigan Sport Business Conference felt these six sport business leaders would be able to provide you with the best insight into the future of branding. The branding panel is moderated by Michael Melfi of Melfi & Associates. Mr. Melfi is one of the nation's exclusive sports and entertainment lawyers specializing in cyber and social media law. Speaking on the branding panel with Mr. Melfi will be Ira Stahlberger, the Senior Vice President of Talent Marketing at IMG World. Mr. Stahlberger spent time at Leo Burnett and Coca-Cola. Next, we have Dahani Jones, a former linebacker for the University of Michigan football team. Dahani is also the host of Dahani Tackles the Globe and the founder of Bowtie Charity Cause for Pro Bowtie Cause Charity Program and Bowtie Cafe in Cincinnati. Our next panelist, David Schwab, is the creator and managing director of Octagon First Call. Mr. Schwab builds beneficial uh, celebrity and corporate partnerships to construct a mutual return on investment. Our next member of the branding panel is Stephen Dubin from Yee and Dubin Sports. Mr. Dubin is a Michigan alumni who graduated in 1985 and has a background in law, advertising, promotions, and marketing. Mr. Dubin represents NFL football player Tom Brady and New Orleans Saints head coach Sean Payton. Our final member of the branding panel is, is Katie Bors. Ms. Bors is a Michigan alumni also and the current director of marketing, communications, and advertising at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Ms. Bors is called upon re regularly to, to contribute the, to the strategic initiatives of Blue Cross Blue Shield, including the development of the company's direct-to-consumer marketing campaigns and direct response advertising. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce the branding panel. Thank you. Thank you. I can't sit down, can't sit down and do this, so I'm going to stand up. Uh, first of all, I want, again, we talked last night, and uh, a few of the guys, we were really acknowledging the students who put this all together, so thank you guys. You guys did a great job with that. Um, for all my panelists, thank you for taking the time out of your day and your busy schedules to be here. I'm excited for this uh, panel to get started. Um, as a social media digital age, we want to make sure that you are tweeting using Facebook. I know that we have our social media person out there doing that. Um, without further ado, our panel is, is a very exciting panel. It's a unique situation where we're able to have athletes, uh, talent representation, personality representation, former athletes, uh, brands, and you're also able to have um, some of the people that represent brands. And in a unique situation, someone actually measures the value of personalities. So with that being said, I, I want to start on hop right in. We're talking about branding personalities in the digital age. Why do brands work with talent? So we'll start with that and hop right into the panel to speak. I'll take that. Thank you. And thank you all for being here this morning, now almost this afternoon. Uh, brands work with talent uh, to break through the clutter, to build the brand awareness, to differentiate themselves in the marketplace, ultimately down the road to increase sales. The example that I always use is or one that's relevant now. Look at Corn Flakes and Gabrielle Douglas, who just won a gold medal in gymnastics this summer. When you walk down the supermarket, you walk down the cereal aisle, there's about 75 different types of cereal. You walk down, you may see Gabrielle Douglas, mm, keep walking, mom does. Next time you come through, maybe it leads you to trial. If the product's not good, you don't come back and, and buy cornflakes again. But if it is, you do. So it's typically for the amplification and, and the trial part. Yeah. Okay. How you doing? First of all, I am uh, very impressed as a Michigan alum that you guys all got up this early. Um, I know I never got up this early to attend anything, um, especially after spending the night at Rick's. So, uh, And by the way, I can't really breathe because I'm wearing one of the honey's bow ties. So, But to answer your question, uh, I come at it from a little different perspective. Uh, I, I have the fortunate um, responsibility to work with some of the, the, the best names in sports and entertainment. And I think one of the real reasons why, as David said, brands decide to work with talent is because it really helps make that emotional connection and humanize many brands. Um, some brands are easier than others. And some brands are that people really feel passionate about. Um, they really have a love affair with the, the Nikes and the Under Armors and the Gatorades. But some other brands... Um, you don't have as much of that love affair. Um, and I hope I'm not insulting one of my fellow panelists, but um, if you work in the insurance industry, for instance, there's not a love affair with insurance. There just isn't. And I think, no offense, 
there's just not. Hey, you know, but, I no, it. but I think I think one of the nice things is when you can humanize that brand with a personality. I think it really helps make that deeper emotional connection. Um, wouldn't you agree, Katie? I would agree, Ira. And go blue. I'm so excited to be back in Ann Arbor. Um, you know, I agree with all of the perspectives here at the table, but representing the largest nonprofit organization in the state of Michigan, um, we have more of a challenge. Obviously, there's a category challenge. It's not a sexy product. We're not hawking gorgeous cars. It's health insurance. I mean, it's like that thing everyone knows they need to have, but you don't think of it top of mind. And I think one of the things the previous, you know, one of the points the previous panel made was experience. And when you look at big brands, you have to look at, yes, all of your traditional broadcast and all of the media that goes into it, but how do you develop layers of experience with target audiences that, frankly, are not brand aligned to you quite yet? So we'll get into, I think, from my perspective, a couple of examples later, but I think experience um, speaks a lot. Um, in the marketplace today, considering how many brands are thrown at everyone. And I think the sports personality um, track really uh, gives us the ability to um, create that experience in a different way for different targets. So, And I would say from the um, personality side, we look at it as should this be a brand that we want to be associated with? And why does the brand, why are they even interested in in you as a personality and you need to find out what the brand's goals are and if you're all on the same page then that's great if it's a brand that for example is a league or team sponsor they paid a lot of money to be a team or league sponsor and they probably are more interested in using the uniform or the trademarks um, versus maybe a non-sponsor who's a lifestyle brand that's looking for a more of a personality and wants to take advantage of a player's success or notoriety, but that's secondary to um, a uniform or a baseball or a, a piece of equipment. And also one way you can think about it is I'm not going to work with any tie brands, neckties that are. I'm only going to work with bow ties. And that's because of just what you know, Mr. Dubin was talking about in terms of the brand affinity and how things and how people work together with those brands. And also the way that I also like to think about it is we live in, you know, we're not in a dial up phase anymore, right? Where our internet is quite quick and we have short temperament and we don't necessarily pay attention that long and we have short attention spans. And because people don't have that long of attention spans, it's what people catch, you know, in terms of which, what your eye catches. And he was talking about walking down the aisle of a grocery store. Who do you recognize? Who do you see? Who do you feel some sort of attractiveness to? And then, because that provides the, the open door to go, in fact, as, as, a, as a consumer, to go purchase a product or be a part of a product. Because that, through that brand experience, through that brand affinity, through that um, brand relationship, um, it becomes part of your own personal lifestyle, just like that person is a part of your lifestyle. Great, thank you. So with that being said, uh, Dahani, as an athlete, how do you determine what brands you wish to work with or associate with? Uh, I, I think uh, the best way to understand which brands you want to work with is to best understand yourself. Um, I think that there's not enough time in some cases that people spend enough time actually diagnosing the top five things that are associated with who you are as a person. Um, my agent and lawyer was you know, Yee and Dubin. And so we spent some time thinking about how to strategically align myself with the brands um, that I wanted to work with. Like I said before, I'm not going to work with a necktie company because of the fact that I wear bow ties. Um, I'm not going to work primarily with a Pepsi company because I like to drink Sprite. Um, uh, you, you start thinking about cause-oriented, um, actionable items that you want to put forth in your own portfolio and how that corporate social responsibility works with those brands. So there's a lot of different ideas that kind of come across the board that you have to be able to diagnose, but it's about actionable items. It's about a, a top priority of list that you focus on that you align yourself with other brands. Yeah, I would echo what Dahani said. I think one of the most salient things you said was be yourself and know yourself. And I think, you know, we, we go out and talk to a lot of 
prospective clients, and a lot of clients call us at, at IMG, and we sit there and we have kind of this this analytic process we kind of go through and really try to understand who they are to that very point. And it's not an easy process when you're sitting with a – it's not easy when you're sitting with a 40-year-old, let alone a 20-year-old or 21-year-old, and you really say, who are you? Who do you want to be and how do you want to be defined? And so much is kind of the company you keep, especially in the, the branding world and certainly in the endorsement world. Um, I'll tell you a little anecdote, a little story. So there's this um, musical – act singer that we now work with um, you may have heard of her uh, she's got this album called red that's out um, she's 22 her name's taylor swift um, anyone heard of her anyone okay good um, i was really worried there for a second but no so she is uh, fantastic but one of the first things that we did because especially on the recording side and the artist side you're very reluctant sometimes to and i hate to use this term but i'll use it sell out um, artists, they think a little bit different. Let's say that athletes sell out, by the way. Athletes don't sell out. But um, uh, some of the musicians that we've worked with, they're very, very conscious of that. And so we sat down with Taylor, and we said to her, well, who do you want to work with? Who defines you? Who represents you? And one of the brands that she mentioned, um, she said, I love getting dressed up. I love makeup. Um, she's like, you know, ideally I'd love to be with someone like uh, Procter & Gamble, one of their brands. And when you think about it, one of her biggest partners is this brand called CoverGirl. And when you think about who she is and who her audience is, and that's an important part of the equation of who she connects with, um, she absolutely connects with young females, young and old females. And it's a perfect fit. It's so natural. And when it's so organic, that's when you know it's right. And for us, it's really getting to something that's so organic and right. And that's really how we, we go about it. And Steve, I know we had some interesting conversations about this. So. Yeah, um, I think it's important, as, as Dahani said, that you have to have a passion for whatever cause or product you're working with, whether it's a foundation you're starting, whether it's a company. You need to believe in the in the product for it really to be successful, and the company needs to really believe in you. Um, two of Tom's current sponsors, um, UGG, which is owned by a company called Deckers, and Under Armour, they both – for almost a year to year and a half after he signed the deal, they were not in a rush to do any types of advertising, any type of marketing. They spent a lot of time. We had four or five meetings with Tom and the key executives, them getting to know him and see what his passions were. Did he like music? Did he like dogs? Did he like working out? What were the things he liked to do and he believed in? And then they went and they started presenting us ideas on, does this really capture what he's thinking, and that that makes a great partnership, not a one-off um, arrangement where somebody is just endorsing a product for a year, and there's really not that connection that's truly there. Selling out. Yeah. What was the What was the sheep? What was the what? The sheep. That was a long time ago. Oh. But you know what? <laughs> that was the sell-out phase. <laughs> this is you know as as um, as Dave Brandon said. Um, World, my business partner and I were a little old school in that we, being in sports, to us, the number one thing is winning. Winning Super Bowls, winning games, uh, and it's hard. And Dahani can tell you how hard it is to win a game, to make a team. And if you develop respect on the field by your peers and you are a winner, then you can go and take risks and do things that – maybe are a little outside the box. And if you don't have that respect from your peers, you're certainly not going to get that respect from people off the field. And Ira, to, to Ira's point about selling out and why Hollywood uh, is more image conscious or musicians are more image conscious, the, the next deal or the, the last deal they did affects their primary income. So if you put yourself in a commercial – a, a poorly done commercial, the next casting director for the film or TV show may not choose you, and your fans may not buy your album. The primary income of an athlete is on the field, and so it, it's less of a direct tie. And, and herein lies the issue because a lot of times, especially as a professional football player, you don't have guaranteed contracts. So if you're a baseball player, you have a guaranteed contract, and you're a basketball player, you have a guaranteed, guaranteed contract, but as a, f a football player, you don't have a guaranteed contract. And to Steve's point, you want to make sure that you are winning on the field so that 
you know, you have that ability to start to divert your attention to working with different brands in order to sort of elevate your position and also increase your your um, your income. But if either of the two stall, then you're kind of in a caught between a rock and a hard spot, and you have to ultimately defer back to your craft. And I had the I was in that position in 2000, 2008 when I was on the Philadelphia Eagles and I was at a five-year contract and I was released after the third year. So then you're forced to reposition yourself within the football industry. And although I had set myself up with different media opportunities, you still have a, a balance to think for yourself. Okay, how much am I going to commit to the game and how much am I going to commit to off the field? So then the next year... I actually went down to New Orleans, got released from New Orleans. Then I was out of a job for three weeks. Then I went back. I got another job with the Bengals. That whole year I started, I didn't do anything in television. I didn't do anything um, with media or didn't, didn't do anything with brands. And I got a new contract, and at the same time I got a new contract, then I started doing things with media again. So it's all about how you balance your time and your energy. We all only have a pie that's 100 Hundred percent. So if you start breaking down how much time and energy is committed towards one or the other, that pie starts eating up. And if your job is seventy-five percent and your family is twenty-five percent, where's your brand fit? You know that five percent towards the brand has got to come from some area of the pie. Great. So are there some best practices that some of you guys are participating in with your talents, with your athletes, to make this branding and personalities work? Steve, Ira. Sure. Yeah, Mr. Agent. Okay. Uh, well, first off, just to again build on what Tahani was saying, it's performance first, right? It's when we sit and talk to this guy named Matthew Stafford, the quarterback of the Lions, comeback player of the year last year, very marketable guy here in Michigan. I do represent him, um, and Katie works with him. Um, one of the things we always say is performance absolutely first. Agent man. Agent. Yeah, exactly. He's I am not bashful of that. I'm wearing your bow tie. Come on. Um, but honestly, it's performance first because that drives everything off the field. Um, but when you ask about best practices, I look at it two ways. One from the from the talent side of things. I said it already: authenticity, being who you are, and partnering with the right brands. That kind of one plus one equals three. Um, but also on the I heard, on the on the branding side of things or on the marketing side of things, I think it's really important that you find the companies that the brands to partner with that really help expand until we said earlier that emotional connection, right? Like the Gatorades of the world, I think there's some of the best. You'll hear later today from a guy named John Shea who runs sports marketing at Gatorade. And you think about that brand. I mean, that brand was a sleepy product that was for the University of Florida football team 35 years ago. And now everyone identifies Gatorade with the very, very best in performance and it's very much on the field. That's why you see it on the sidelines at NFL games, and you see it in the dugouts at baseball games, and you see it because it's all about performance for them. And that's what they work with. If you look at their portfolio, it's always with the very best. The Peyton Mannings of the world and the Eli Mannings of the world, uh, the best tennis players, so forth and so on. So I think that is really two sides of it, but they've always got to be tied together. I'm going to take the contrarian view. From a brand perspective, or when we're buying talent, it's not just about performance. The marketability, some, take Tim Duncan for a second. You can't get any better from a performance and from a team perspective, but he doesn't have the gregarious uh, extrovert personality or doesn't have an affinity to certain products or causes, and so therefore he's not marketable. And so it's on the field help. I don't represent Tim Duncan. To say. I don't represent him. That's okay if you did. <laughs> When we evaluate a deal, whether it's you know for a high-profile player or a, a lesser-known player, to me the number one uh, thing we look at is what do they want? How much time do they want? What are the duties they want? And the money kind of becomes the last thing to negotiate because you can reel them in if they start realizing this is a good a good fit. Uh, and when it comes to negotiation, the number one tool is the ability to say no to a company. Uh, especially if you're a highly marketable person, because the more you say no, the more they want it, the more they want you, and the more they may um, revise what they want. But you need to look at what the oblig what your obligations are. Um, I was in an event um, 12 years ago, and Michael Jordan um, 
and Tom Brady were speaking to each other, and Tom asked Michael, during your career, how many days during the year or during the offseason did you spend doing commercials? And he said, you know, 50 to 60 days. And Tom looked at me and said, if we ever get to that number, you're fired. Uh, and so, you know, we probably aim for four days, none during the season. Um, and again, one of the challenges in today's digital age is there's so much attention on these players. There's so many ways to reach them. Uh, and there's the expression that my business partner always had is that the nail that sticks up the highest gets pounded down the hardest. And we do live in a society where people like to build up their heroes and like to see them fail. So you need to control that and make sure that what are people thinking when they see a commercial and if the player throws an interception, are people thinking, if he wouldn't have done that commercial, maybe he wouldn't have thrown that interception. Even though it's completely unrealistic, those are the things that go through our mind. So, it's always interesting when you have someone who's the ultimate athlete and the ultimate highest the highest profile athlete that's out there, right? Tom Brady is known from here all the way around the globe. Then you have sort of your mid-tier athlete that's not necessarily getting paid as much but also has that markability and that balance who in some cases can't say no, wants to say no, but at the same time wants that extra amount of income. So it's always a balance in the same way that Brady only wants to film four days out of the year you know, when I did my Travel Channel show when I was playing on the Bengals, I had one day off after get, being on the road for 50 days before I went into training camp. F five states, 10 days each state, filming every day, playing a different sport in a different country, one day off before going into full training camp and into, into the entire season and also into the postseason. And to Steve's point, if I messed up at all on the field, it would be blamed on the travel. But at the same time, if I messed up in the travel, then I'd be unhappy on the field. Good point. So there's always that, that balance that you have to find, and it comes at different points in an athlete's life. When you first transition into the league, I always tell guys the first three years, you have to have your head down. Don't look at the distractions and try to find too many different ways to occupy your time. When you get later on in your career, depending upon your positioning, you can start to be more mature with your decisions and the things that you do and start taking chances because hopefully you've built that savings to now put yourself out on a limb. And most athletes, you probably would agree, when they're 22, aren't thinking like that. They think more of... In the moment. Well, this gets into another conversation about the mentality of athletes and the responsibility of whether it be uni universities, whether it be the leagues themselves. How many um, Michigan athletes or Michigan football players from my, are in the room? We have two Michigan football players or one? Two? Or one? One. <laughs> I don't think inter interrail doesn't count. So, so there's there's one. So is that the fault of the team? Is that not the consciousness of the players? Is that the responsibility of the university? And you you see how the effect starts to ripple on, and move forward. So Tom is an exceptional example, but he's also an exception to the room to the rule. I was drafted in the sixth round. And I was always a blue-collar worker on the field. I never tackled Tom. He made me upset a couple of times because I didn't get to him. <laughs> but it's all about balance of time, energy, and understanding your positioning, too. Great. And, Katie, as to the brand, you know, how do you, do you take a side with David on this as, as far as what's most important to you when you're looking at the athlete? Is it about winning? Is it about who they are? What, 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 what do you guys look at? You know, it's really, especially in my case, it's all about character. And... Um, I think, Dahani, you said this earlier, but what makes up their brand and what's important to them. When we started working with Ira and Matthew Stafford, you know, we had sort of, you know, we had a little courtship, you know, if you will. And it was sort of a get to know ya 
type of thing because our brand in the state of Michigan is very well established. It's 73 years old, <laughs> and we have to start reinventing ourselves. So when we look at athletes or potential partners in the marketplace, they really have to reflect the values of our brand as well. Um, you know, community-centered in Michigan, uh, you know, just value, trust, those types of attributes have to align with the person that we're going to work with. And in the case of Matthew Stafford, we found, um, you know, the stars aligned. You know, he, he, uh, he displays all of the qualities that our brand does. So it's an easy fit. However, when we talk about product, um, we're not going to have Matthew Stafford selling health insurance. It creates a completely disingenuous, I mean, I see some people smiling, like seriously, um, experience in the marketplace. It doesn't make sense. So where do we have to develop um, our target audiences? Because we have really high brand recognition. Everyone goes, oh, you must have a really easy job. Well, that's how they sound in my head, but that doesn't how it goes. But, you know, wow, that's great. That sounds like fun. You're only, you can only go in one direction at that point, you know, if you have really high brand recognition. We have national health care reform coming at us very quickly. And now after Tuesday, um, things are going to look a lot different in this environment. So when we look at partnering with folks, it's a very strategic position. And in the case of Matthew Stafford and aligning brand attributes, we don't use him to sell insurance. We work with him to address health disparities in the community. And you're thinking, okay, well, all right, what's the connection there? I'm getting to it. He has so much cachet in Michigan. This is a sports state. It's a, Detroit is a sports town. I don't have to tell anybody in this room that. I mean, it's fabulous. And his brand was immediately heightened the second he stepped into the state and became um, the quarterback for the Detroit Lions. And when we developed our partnership, we looked at it and said, Where are our bra where's our brand lacking? Who's not going to have brand loyalty with us as we sort of march through this journey? Young people. It's not your father's health insurance anymore. They're not going to, they don't care. Because there's going to be so many other carriers out there. How do we differentiate our brand? Well, we're going to start to have a conversation with young people. And we talk about the digital age, and I think making that connection is really important because that's all, that's the conversation now, you know. Um, so when we go out with Matthew, we address childhood obesity issues because, frankly, we have the highest numbers um, as a state, unfortunately, nationally. And he goes out and he talks to kids. And can you imagine Matthew Stafford coming to your school? You should see these kids, and they all have one of these. And they're all doing this, and they're tweeting it, and they're getting super excited, and it's a really amazing experience. Right there, we've activated the brand. You know, so on or off the field, performance or not, from my perspective as a brand partner, we look at our personalities and our partnerships as reflective of our own. So. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm seeing we're going to do a Q&A. While I'm getting ready to mic to pass over, I just have one question for the panel. Take one minute, one of you guys just to answer it. How is the digital age affecting how we're branding personalities? Can someone just take that and take a minute and really kind of take a stab at it? I'll just take a stab to say it's, it's easier for an athlete to brand themselves. Ten years ago, Olympians were relevant every four years. Now they finish their cycle and they go on Dancing with the Stars and they build their followers. There's more clutter because of it, but there's more of an opportunity to build their profile. Uh, before we get to the Q&A, I just want to make a quick announcement. Uh, after the Q&A, if you could all please stay seated, we have an important announcement about lunch. So open up for questions. There is no lunch. Is there lunch? There's no lunch. There's no lunch. <laughs> uh, this this uh, question is for Steve. I was wondering, uh, do you see the, the hurdles with uh, Sean Payton and the release of contract dealing with the um, Bounty Gate? In with branding and personality. Yeah, I, I really can't talk about that. <laughs> are, you, are you avoiding a I question? I appreciate your concern on that. Avoidance. <laughs> oh, good question. <laughs> yes, Steve, great question. In general. <laughs> Lunch? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, not addressing his situation, but in general, um, 
you know, players do encounter situations where there's negative publicity about them. And um, you know, my background before I ever went to law school, before I ever did this, was in public relations. And one school of thought that we follow a lot is um, uh, most things will simply go away on their own. And living in L.A., where you see a lot of actors and actresses and celebrities, they start getting into the battle of uh, um, released statements. And, again, that's one of the reasons why we do encourage most of our players to keep a pretty low profile on Twitter because the more your people are accustomed to you putting messages out there, the more they're going to expect you to address whatever issue it may be. So if you keep a lower profile, no one really is going <coughs> to think anything is any different that you're not really addressing that issue. Has anybody seen Boardwalk Empire? You remember when Nucky Thompson got in trouble and uh, Rothstein said to him, what did, what did he say? He said, I'm a betting man, and sometimes I, I, I know when the bet's right. And sometimes I just have to sit and wait and not do anything at all. And in the case of Peyton, in terms of, you know, what Steve was talking about, sometimes you have to wait. And as it relates back to the digital age, now you can't necessarily wait because the digital age is all over you. You have every single media outlet. You have every single so Twitter aspect. I mean, all right, case in point, Diane Sawyer, what did she do on air? She slurred her words. She was slurring her words, laying on the table. She was not drunk. She was tired. 20 years ago, she wasn't drunk. No, right? tired, tired, tired. Tired, completely tired. tired. Clearly, sleepy. One eye was closed. Right. Yeah. Clearly. Clearly. She was at Rick's, I believe, the other night. Rick's. Nice. But in the, age, in, in the digital age, sometimes you don't have that opportunity to sit and wait. And, I, and, and obviously, in the days of Boardwalk Empire, this was like 1920s, 1930s. And things only went as far as the city itself or as far as somebody would take that message and, and travel. But now it's instantaneous. Yeah, part I, of that, I'm going to just add one more thing. Ira. Part of it is who defines the story. Do you define the story or do you let the public define it? But there are times when the story comes out and has been defined before you have a chance. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, maybe it does, you, you do take a second and let the story just play out until you want to come back to it. And, and I think any, in, in the whole Twitter thing, whether it's this situation, people need to um, think before they hit send and say, is this something that I should even be saying anything about? Is it something that people even want to hear? And a lot of times when you hear or read of um, rather bold statements that are put out there, about a day later, you see some apologies. Uh, the Monday Night Football game, the Marcus Vick, the brother of Michael Vick, was tweeting all during the game. Some pretty um, harsh things about uh, Michael's teammates, about the coaches, and obviously Michael's playing. I'm assuming he's not seeing those tweets during the game, but 24 hours after the game, Marcus is apologizing, and I'm sure it had something to do with a conversation with his brother about it. Because maybe the brands would get upset about Marcus and what he said, and then all of a sudden, the attention gets diff you know the attention gets skewed and then all of a sudden there's an issue so that's that's where the fine line comes in because now all your family is the one that's being affected by it too can i just say a little bit of a contrarian point in terms of i believe i agree with you in terms of do you sometimes let things lie um, i'm sure you're all pretty familiar uh, with this guy who's a pretty well known cyclist right and uh, he won Seven, eight, I don't even know how many. It's bicycling, so who really cares? But um, he uh, zero. zero. He won but he won he won a lot of he won a lot of Tour de France's and he tried to let this thing lie and let it go away and plausible deniability and all this stuff. And honestly as a marketer and a agent rep I don't like to say agent, marketing manager, brand store, brand curator in some way, um, he hurts all of us. When when someone like him does what he does, and as an athlete, I'm sure, Dahani, I mean, when you, the most important thing I talked about performance, and I believe character and all that stuff is important, but that sacred trust that you have with the fan, and when you break that, it, it hurts, obviously it hurts the athlete, but it hurts everybody. 
It hurts everybody, and everyone's like, well, it's just like that guy, that golf guy that crashed into a fire hydrant. He does not an IMG client anymore, so I can talk about it. Um, but he, he broke the sacred trust in a very different way because he didn't, he didn't cheat in the game. And I feel very strong, very strongly about when you start messing with the game. And, you know, who knows what's the truth, but if you read all the statement, we've done a lot of stuff. And when you break that sacred trust, um, there's almost there's no going, but no coming back. And that's an interesting story that will play out, obviously. But that's a big part of what we do. And obviously the athletes that we are fortunate enough to work with, um, when, they, when they mess around with that, uh, th there's, <laughs> that's, that's a game changer uh, for everybody. Okay. And I think we had another question from the crowd. Sure. Um, Dahani, first of all, I want to tell you, I know that that um, Woodson interception at uh, Michigan State would not have happened without uh, the work you did to plow that Spartan over. So I appreciate thank that. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, that's clearly an audience plant right thank there. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes. Right. Dahani's been waiting yeah. You guys can all tweet about that. Thank you. Yeah. I, was gonna say, I, yeah. I do actually have a question other than, you know, how does it Are you saying that I provided system? insurance? <laughs> <laughs> Other than how does it feel to maul a Spartan, um, I guess my question is, you, you touched on corporate social responsibility, and since we're sitting here at the business school, I have to ask, I mean, how, how much does that play into the decisions that you make about your brand? I mean, you talked about liking um, Sprite better than, you know, you like Pepsi, so obviously that's a decision, but, you know, do you think at all about, like, how, uh, you know, the, the Coca-Cola company harvests its sugar cane and are, is it using illegal practices? I mean, how, you know, how, how much does corporate social responsibility really play into the decisions you make? I think, it, I think it comes down to what part of corporate social response, what part of corporate social responsibility you're most vested in. Uh, if, a, if a company is not dedicating their effort towards education and you want them to dedicate their effort towards education, are you going to work with them or not? You know, I'm, I care about the environment. I care about um, I care about education. Um, it's it's always it's always important to know what best practices a brand is working on um, because that is a reflection of what you're representing as well. Because if something comes out, that's obviously a reflection because you're the front person. Obviously, you're the one that's representing. You're the you're the now the face, the CEO, the the one that everybody's leaning on as being the representative, and so you're automatically going to be attached to that. So it's very important to pay attention to the corporate social responsibility of the brands that you're working with. It's interesting when, when um, and I'm sure Dahani has seen this, and you guys have seen that when a company gets a contract, there's a, usually a morals clause that they want to put in there that if the athlete does anything that's you know an embarrassment. Well, I, I come back with my standard language of well, what happens if the company does something that we feel is reprehensible, and it's just silence on the other end because they, you know, in their mind that could never happen. Um, but it is a, it's an important thing, and and you have that with, um, you know, any apparel company that you may do a deal with has most of them are manufactured overseas, and something can always come up on that. So some of it, it's you just have to say. You know, if they once came to us about um, the media came to us, I think Reebok or somebody had some conflict going on, and like we said, listen, we we have no control over where they manufacture, and if they're doing things that aren't right, then that they need to rectify that. But you know, you do have to keep that in mind. And we knew we'd have a lively panel here. We felt like it went for a lot longer than this. I, I'm giving the signal. I have one more question we're going to have, and then we'll be wrapping it up. is directed more at Mr. Newman and Mr. Stahlberger. You mentioned issues like a Tiger Woods or a Lance Armstrong when they've been through the media in such a negative portrayal. Would you mind going into the process of rebuilding a brand or making someone more marketable, um, someone like a Kobe Bryant who went from being on trial to winning titles and now is in the good graces of fans again? Um, <laughs> winning cures a lot of things. And um, it also helped with Kobe that and I mean, I don't represent him. I live in that city. A lot of his competition for marketing dollars and exposure left. There really was no well-known player at the time on the Dodgers. There wasn't anybody else in the Lakers. Shaq left, and um, and there was nobody on the Clippers. So it it took a while for him. It helped that he won. Living in that city, I didn't really see him doing anything. Um, outward that really changed people's perceptions of him. He's, um, he's got a, 
um, feisty relationship with the media. That never changed. And I think it was really an, an example with him of a company saying, you know what, let's just roll the dice. He's a great player, and he's in a big market. Um, but a lot of players can't – it's very difficult to rebuild a brand. Um, and um, we're fortunately, I haven't really had to deal with that very much. Me neither, which is nice. Uh, that's a great question, and I'll give you, uh, I think, my three best answers to it. Um, I'm going to contradict myself a little bit because the first of which is time. Time does help, uh, certainly in the case of that golf guy, uh, certainly in the case of Kobe. Uh, time, it will remain to be seen if time will heal that, that cyclist guy. Um, I, I don't know about that one. Um, I, I think also uh, performance, as you said, Steve, uh, winning is a great panacea, and when you win and perform, and at least in Kobe's case, obviously you won championships afterwards. Um, Tiger is not quite back to where he was, and I don't know if he'll ever get there, but he's certainly starting to perform. He's number two golfer in the world right now. Um, but I think also the last piece, which is really probably the most critical and the most germane, is being honest. Honesty is really, really powerful. And when you start apologizing, and I think in Tiger's case at least, and he, his, his agent is a good buddy of mine, and we've talked about it a little bit, and it took time for him, I think, you know, to kind of figure out the story and kind of come, come out. And it didn't come out probably ideally, and I'm not a PR expert uh, at all, but I think when you make a mistake, as we all, we all, we've all made mistakes, and I think when you are honest about them, and you own up to them, um, it's, it's amazing how forgiving the American populace is. Two, two huge differences between Lance, Kobe, and Tiger. One, Lance isn't performing anymore. And so he doesn't have the ability on the course. And then two, his crime or criminal action is on the course versus personal life. Great. So with that being said, a big round of applause. Thank you to Hani, Katie, David, and Stephen.